I hope that's okay with colleagues. But um, if um, you have any concerns with recording, please drop me in a message through the chat function with your preferences. Um, and uh, I will be stopping the recording for the um, certain times as you see appropriate. But um, there is a, a kind of um, preference from our keynote speaker, but also other projects to, uh, to, to, to be recorded and, and also to, to share this publicly afterwards. So uh, my name is Tolib Mirzoev. I am um, head of the Nafield Center for International Health and Development at the University of Leeds and Associate Professor in International Health Policy and Systems. And so I'll be moderating this um, session, although the session is largely kind of being led by um, Tony Danzapier, Dr. Tony Danzapier, and I will introduce him in a, in a minute. So um, first things first, maybe a couple of housekeeping um, requests to everybody. If you can keep your microphones unmuted uh, for the duration of the presentation, that would be much appreciated, largely because there is um, usually echo kind of going through and, and, and that affects the sound quality. And similarly, if you find uh, the sound or the video breaking off, then sometimes it helps to turn your uh, webcam off. Uh, and I will be turning my webcam off uh, uh, when the presentation starts. Um, and um, I would also request you to hold on to your questions and comments. I think there is a preference uh, from the presenter um, to either pause at different parts of the session. And, and um, I know that Tony's presentations are very interactive. So um, please hold on with excitement uh, for the specific times when he will be posing questions. But if possible, also just keep noting your questions and comments till the end of the presentation. And then um, towards the end, just um, um, type them up in the chat function. And then I will uh, kind of summarize and will pose them to, to Tony. So I will be kind of uh, carrying this function. Um, I hope that's okay, but if there are any concerns, um, as always, um, do, do drop me a line. Uh, so this is the second um, webinar in our series of uh, capacity strengthening events. So the first webinar was in um, kind of, um, um, earlier, several weeks ago, uh, that provided a broad introduction to uh, the um, kind of the whole concept of evidence synthesis and systematic reviews. And today's webinar will be very much zooming into the uh, first specific step, um, i.e. developing the protocol, refining research questions, and identifying search criteria. And Tony will cover them in a bit more depth. So hopefully this kind of skill building session will be a bit more practical uh, and will help you uh, to get going with the next steps. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are recording this webinar and the recording will be available um, um, sort of up to, to view afterwards. So we'll share that uh, with, with um, colleagues. Um, so the... Um, Without any further ado, what I would like to do now is to introduce briefly uh, our keynote speaker. I think I've introduced that um, at the previous webinar, but just in case if you were not there, uh, Dr. Tony Danzapier has 25 years of experience in evidence-based approaches, having conducted his first systematic review in 1996. Since then, he has been involved uh, uh, with evidence generation, translation, and promotion using various methods, tools, and techniques. Uh, Tony worked in Europe and is currently based at the University of Ghana. Here he set up the University of Ghana Center for Evidence Synthesis and Policy, which is a member of the Global Evidence Synthesis Initiative Network, and introduced systematic re into the university's teaching curriculum. He also developed evidence-based medicine curriculum for the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, residency program. Tony is currently involved in a number of uh, international working groups, 
for example, European cooperation in science and technology that works towards developing evidence-based uh, research training program for clinical researchers in Europe, systematic review editor, editors training and learning initiative for experienced authors, and guidelines international network for low and middle income countries. And has been serving as an advisor and consultant to the WHO for over 15 years in neglected tropical diseases. And he's also a mentor of the African Academy of Sciences, uh, providing career pathway, policy engagement, and leadership development guidance for early career scientists. Um, uh, Dr. Danza Apia has successfully supervised um, over 40 postgraduate students, and his current interests are um, in capacity building and evidence synthesis and translation to advance innovative, evidence informed, demand driven policy-relevant and contextualized research in low and income countries. So without any further ado, um, can I welcome to the virtual stage our keynote speaker. And please put your virtual and uh, physical hands together um, to Dr. Tony um, Danso Apia. So um, Tony, over to you. Um, and I'm putting my virtual and the physical <laughs> hands together. So please go ahead. Thank you so much. Talib for just a detailed introduction. Thanks so much. Sometimes I want to shy away from it, but sometimes there's also the need for people to know who you are because in classes we know that sometimes if students don't know who their lecturer is, sometimes it takes a lot of uh, convincing to, to let them maybe flow along with you. But if they know already that you know and they, they, they have some information about you, then you don't have to convince them anymore. So at least this is just to tell them that I've been involved in this area. Thank you so much. And that the pilot for this plane is, is a, it's an experienced one. And then you will land you safely. So please keep cool. Don't panic. We are, this is another day that we're doing. I continue with a systematic review a webinar series. Um, the topic for today, going on, start to share my, um, my screen. Is preparing the review protocol, formulating the review question and developing the inclusion and exclusion criteria. This is the evidence synthesis webinar two, and today is 19th August, 2020. So why developing a protocol and formulating a review um, question? Before then, we have to go back a little bit. The other time when we met, I sort of sensitized most of you who are not too familiar with evidence synthesis or systematic reviews, but I know that most of you have some people are we have some experienced people in systematic reviewing so let's recap just a little bit of what we uh, uh, what i said in the previous webinar systematic reviews evolved out of a need to ensure that decisions affecting people's lives can be informed by an up-to-date and complete understanding of research evidence an up-to-date and complete understanding of research evidence. I showed you this favorite slide, but the part that I, didn't, I haven't included over here is when I defined the systematic review and I said, this is very important. That slide alone, if you can tell what is on it, it is enough to talk about what systematic review is and not. And that slide I said, systematic review is one, a secondary research that attempts to collate all empirical evidence that meet pre-specified eligibility criteria and uh, try to answer a specific research question. And it does, it does that by what? Following an explicit, transparent, and reproducible methods. So it's methodical to what identify studies and how do you identify studies through comprehensive search and this is the next uh, part that we're going to consider in the next session uh, 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 webinar three and i we have to 
information will be sent to you. I think we have competent people also around who would help with this. So uh, information will be sent to you in due course. And then you select, after you have set for the studies, you have to select the studies. What, how do you do it? Using validated study selection tool or form. And then you critically appraise or assess quality of the included studies for risk of bias. The, in, the whole issue is risk of bias because quality per se can never be assessed unless you use elements like the risk that they will overestimate or underestimate the true uh, evidence. So we do that by using validated tools. There are so many tools out there that have been validated that you can use, but normally you have to pick the relevant one, the one which is suited to your study design. And then after that, you extract data using validated study design, study data extraction form. And then after that, you synthesize the, the data or the evidence. And this is over here, we have the narrative and we have the meta analysis or the mixed. So from all this, the one, two, three, four, everything is the same for qualitative, quantitative. This is where we have differences between how data are analyzed or synthesized. From there, this one is still the same for qualitative and quantitative. You report the result in what in a clear and accessible format. So if you have done everything, the right things right, and you are unable to report your result in a clear and accessible format, it is also not a systematic review. So, and then you interpret the findings by considering carefully any flaws in the evidence. So that is also critical because without discussing the flaws and limitations, uh, people might not make it, will not be able to make a decision about the level, of the level of evidence or how good your evidence is. Let me put this one over here. So the systematic review process. Those of you who have been science students or even if you are not science, people are familiar with this distillation process. This is distillation. That you have some substance over here in this flux and then it pulls through processes over here. Why am I showing that? Because at that time I said that systematic review is the only method that uses a gold standard tools and approaches to distill evidence at the highest possible level. And if you know distillation is the best method that you can use to separate impurities from uh, maybe uh, impurities. So once you go through the distillation process, what you get over here is the pure substance. So if we follow systematic review process and look at this one, there are so many things that come together to make distillation possible. All this, there's a heat over here. If there's no heat, something goes wrong. There's something over here flat. And this is the same thing applies to systematic review. There are so many principles and decisions, judgments that you have to make. When, uh, your inability to make such judgments and decisions will influence the over the final results. So let's move on. Now, this systematic review has also been likened to this like a sieve. We have so many things. Like after systematic review is the process that you go through to sieve and then get the best out of that which you retrieve. You retrieve so uh, much that you have to sieve to get that which is relevant to the question that you're going to answer. So if you look at here, what authors do, this is what we all do systematic reviewers and those who are going to do systematic review for the first time, this is the process you have to go through. You stay identify issues, the problem, and then now come out with a question. You formulate the question. Once you have that, you write a plan of how you're going to go about your research and which is the protocol. And that is what we are going to do today. So we're going to look at how to formulate the research question and how to write a protocol for your systematic review. The rest is what we're going to follow later on. But you have to search. And when you search, you retrieve so many studies and look at the sieve, depending on the, on the mesh size. Sometimes the so it's restrict that only few particles can filter through. And those that filter through, based on your mesh size, 
or is the one that is relevant to the question that you have because you have really defined what you need over here on the basis of the question so this one will come to you and you have to the source has been really um uh, the person who drew this was by jessica kaufman is a cochrane consumer and a communication research group who did this one and it's very useful but let's go through this one it's one of the pioneers in uh, systematic reviews cynthia Malro wrote something in bmj clinical research in 1994 that was just the time that systematic reviews were emerging were evolving and he said that upon all the noises that we make about the systematic review process and those in there we can summarize everything into one sen one sentence simple one that the whole idea is that gathering the research getting rid of the rubbish and summarizing the best of what remains and that i also agree perfectly with uh, this one you can look for this paper it is in the bmj clinical it has been cited over 1500 or something so people have cited and it's a really well written paper so let's move on now we are talking about secondary research which is systematic review and we are seeing that most of it is a process and then the process is made up of so many things that we're going to uh, discuss just in, in uh, immediately we're going to move on to discuss those things so we'll take you through them but we want to let you know that systematic review protocol is no different from the research proposals that we talk about. Most of the time when we are doing um, primary research, we say, we, normally we say it is research proposal. But when we are doing a systematic review, we say protocol. What is the difference? I, over here, I'm saying that there's no difference. It's the, they are the, the two are the same. Because it's the concept of an idea and how you move your idea through. So now let us move through rationale for protocol. So why do we need even a systematic review protocol in the first place? And do we normally write the review protocol? And we will see most people don't write and most editorial bases don't even consider that. And is it right or wrong? We're going to see whether it is right or wrong. Well, as soon as you finish your systematic review, you send it to an editorial base. They will, they will accept it depending on how they, they, they assess the quality of it or how you have written it and you'll publish it sometime without even requesting the systematic review protocol. But Cochrane, which started the whole evolution, thinks that protocol is very important and most editorial bases like BMJ and then the, the systematic review journals, they accept the fact that once you, if you want to write a systematic review, full systematic review for publication, you have to first publish your protocol. And why is it so? Prepare because what? Preparing a systematic review is a complex undertaking, and it involves a lot of judgments and decisions. So don't take this one for granted, irrespective of the problem at hand. If your question is straightforward or complex, the systematic review process is complex and it involves a lot of judgments and decisions and these judgments and decisions are made by you the author or the authors and that's why if you get some of them wrong you are going to get the systematic review wrong so take particular note of this one the judgments and decisions there might not be something that you can assign a quantitative values they are not quantitative in nature they are just judgments Review author's prior knowledge of the results of a potentially eligible study may influence aspects of the, uh, of the review, including the de definition of the review question, criteria for study eligibility, choice of comparisons to include in the analysis, the outcomes to be reported in the review. So if you are knowledge you know some information about what you're going to do already it's not to say that you don't have to know what you're going to do but the kind of things that would influence your decisions and judgment if you have already opinion about something and that is what we are talking about therefore developing a review protocol minimizes the potential for bias so normally because this is normal systematic review is a process Biases are our main uh, problem that you have to take uh, consider seriously when you're doing a systematic review. 
So what it does is that we try as much as possible to minimize bias uh, in the judgment and decisions that we make during the systematic review process. Then once you also do a, a protocol, write a protocol for a systematic review, you sort of promote transparency of the methods used in the review process. And also it reduces potential for duplication. So over here, you introduce transparency, not only that, you sort of also uh, try to minimize the potential for duplication. Why duplication is so important in systematic review? That, that time I said, systematic review sort of build all the evidence in the studies that people have conducted and it gives one single or common statement. So when a systematic review is well conducted, you don't have to look at the evidence reported in primary studies, no. You have to fall on the evidence in the uh, systematic review because it has aggregated, has collated all the separate evidence from all the studies into a single statement. And that is why it is very important. And the idea is, once a systematic review has been done and another systematic review is done on the same topic, most cases they will reach different conclusions which one do you now take? And that is why we are trying as much as possible to uh, uh, minimize duplication. And that is why PROSPRO, which is a database house and a center for reviews and dissemination in New York is doing. So all those who are doing a systematic review, I encourage you for some editorial basis, they will not require you to, uh, they will not require your systematic review to be registered in PRO Prospero before they accept it for publication. But most standard journals will require that you give them the Prospero a registration number. So please, if you are developing a, a system or preparing a systematic review, visit Prospero and then Pros Prospero, sorry, Prospero, and then uh, register your systematic review. It checks, it try to minimize duplication. So if the study has been done by some group or somebody, then the, the flag will be, will, be, will, be, will be made and then it will tell you that somebody has written this systematic review or it is ongoing, it is a process, so it can be accepted, which is the right thing to do. But above all, protocols, when you prepare a protocol, it allows peer review of the plan method. This is very important because why is this so? In, in, in like any other study, if you, uh, there are some problems and then errors are committed, you can deal with errors and other things by maybe the way you analyze the, the data by doing subgroup sensitivity analysis and all those things. We have statistical method to do a whole lot of things. But one thing that you cannot correct when a mistake has already been introduced is the design and the methods. The design that you, you have, the study design and the methods that you have used to collect or implement the study, you cannot come back to revise it. That is why it is very important. So peer reviewers look into your study design and look at the processes that you have outlined to now conduct your systematic review and they can give you suggestions, they can give you comments as to whether it is uh, good or not. So it is very important if you want to write a good systematic review, although sometimes it can be and friendly at this level. But if you take it in good faith, it helps your own systematic review because some of them will be critical. You'll come out with questions that you need to answer before you do the systematic, full systematic review because most of it, it is peer review. It, you can publish a systematic review protocol on its own, it can be accepted as a publication. So take that chance, opportunity to first, let peer reviewers review to improve your methods for you. Because at the end of it all, the study is yours. When somebody cites and it's good, like the uh, Cynthia Mauro paper I'm talking about, she's the author, but she might have gone through series of peer review, some of them uncomfortable, but at the end of it all, the profana product is what we see, and this is what has been accredited to her. So take advantage of that and go through the peer review for your protocol. Then protocol development. All starts with the review question. 
Because in the first place, if you don't have a question, if you don't have a problem, then you don't have a question, isn't it? But if you have a problem, then you come out with a question. So protocol or systematic review starts with a problem, and from there with a question to answer the problem. So the review question should address the choices or practical options people face when deciding about healthcare. So it's not helpful to focus on trivial outcomes or trivial issues because of because that is what has been reported in papers. No, you have to set all this in priority before even you set up to do the systematic review. The methods used in the systematic review should be selected to optimize the likelihood that the results would provide the best evidence upon which to base practice decisions and policy. So all that we're doing, doing to the process is rigorous, robust, to minimize biases so that it improves the likelihood that the evidence that you have produced is reliable to inform policy practice and all decision making. So this is the systematic review um, process, the content. When you are writing a systematic review, there is no, you, you, there's no abstract. Let me say this one first. There's no abstract. There's no plain language. You don't have results. There's no discussion, no author's conclusions. All that you concentrate is the background, objectives, methods, uh, acknowledgement, contributions of authors and declaration. Probably I have to switch over from here and then immediately come back to move you into the Cochrane uh, 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 review uh, manager which is the Revman, to see how this thing has been outlined over there. It is very important that if authors who are writing systematic reviews, no matter which journal you're sending it to, if you follow those principles, it's very important. And at a point when in, the, in our journey, it will get to a time that you'll be introduced to the Revman. Everybody is free. Everybody will be asked to download it and then, yeah, to use it. It's very helpful. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm going back to all probably. What I'll do is that let me move on. I'll, I'll have some time to organize this within the same today to show you some of the examples that I want to you people to know before we finish. So let's move on. I will show you, come back to show you the Revman and how it has been arranged. Then Defining the review question, we are writing a protocol, but within the protocol, the first thing that you do is defining the review question. Why do we have to define the review question? Or in other words, we say formulating the review question. Why do we formulate review question? It is important to have a clear understanding of the question to be answered with a review before a review is started. It is the first essential step of a systematic review. The review question guides many aspects of the systematic review, including the eligibility criteria, set strategy, data collection and synthesis. Later on, when we move on, you will see how the review question is very important in every element that you consider in systematic review. You come back, you visit the, uh, the review question over and over again because it is intertwined with even the inclusion and exclusion criteria and the, all the search terms that you use, even the flow chart for the uh, selection of studies, a whole lot of things. You'll come back. You, you know, no, you'll do, you do it later on in some of the seminars. But in the next um, uh, webinar that we're going to do, which is um, searching for studies and managing the search output, the, the experts who are going to consider this would take that one into consideration and you see how important the question is in doing, preparing your search strategy and then doing the search. We have two main forms of questions to answer our re uh, uh, problems. The first one is we have the narrow question. This one is easy to write and straightforward. Because sometimes you will need to do so many systematic reviews to get around the problem because you always want to go through the straight one. So I suggest that for beginners, those who want to write a fair systematic review, you have your question should be straightforward because the processes are the same. Processes, whether complex or uh, narrow, the process of doing a systematic review is, 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 uh, is the same. So for you to save yourself, uh, the, 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 
problems of those kind of complex issues in systematic review, I suggest that probably you go through the narrow questions and then later on when you gain an experience, you do the broad. But if you are working in a group and you have expertise over the people who are content specialists, you can do the broad because they will guide. The broad tends to be comprehensive, uh, comprehensive and generalizable, but because it's complex, it may miss subgroup effect. And that is why now, most of the case, I'm making a case that most people who are looking for evidence on um, the African continent or pertaining to African context, you have to make it sub-Saharan Africa or Africa. Because normally systematic reviews are global and that is how it started with few people with global um, mindset because hypertension is happy, hypertension is everywhere. And if you do it, then they will do, uh, they will lump all the studies together and give a global picture that we know that the context and the dynamics and then situations are not the same. So how, and the fact that if you do that, with the likelihood that you miss special or a specific or important subgroup effect is high. That is why I'm asking that now restrict it to the context and situation so that if there's any subgroup effect, you would uncover it. So now let's in a snapshot, the review question defines your destination. Yes, where you want to go. The other time I said something about what the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan said that life is full of choices and to live, to live is to choose. And to choose well is to know where you're going. Systematic review is the same. It's a journey that we are embarking and for the examples that are shown. To be able to reach your destination, the right things have to be done and you need all of them. So. This is a question defines your destination, where you want to go. So if the question is not defined well, then you won't reach your destination because it would start now. If you don't key in the right postcode, you would get, it will send you to, it will, you will get lost. But if you key in the, 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 the right postcode, then it should send you to your destination, even though probably you driving, you don't know where it is. So the same thing with the review question is very, very important. For the, for the fact of that, uh, on the basis of what I said earlier, that the guys most part of the systematic review. So the review protocol, so you are talking about the question and protocol. The protocol, however, details your proposed route and activities. So the route you want to take, that is the, the, this how you're going to go about it, what is there, what you have to, all the, the things that you going to encounter it is your proposal the uh, protocol that is going to outline the, the, the uh, how and the whys. So you will continually consult the review question and protocol when you are doing a systematic review. Don't forget any time you will have to consult your review protocol and question. When you are doing the search, when you are doing the selection, any time you have to be moving back and forth. And be aware, be, be, be aware that both review question and protocol may take longer than you think, especially if the review is complex. The protocol may take some time and the review question getting it right will also take some time. So these are some of the practicalities that you have to know. It's not everything so straightforward as may be expected. So now the question. The first one is when you formulating your question, we say ask an answerable question. Inability, why is this so? Because inability to ask a focused and precise clinical question or any question, public health question, can be a major issue in the evidence generated. Why? Because the question leaves most aspect of the review. So if your question is not appropriate, when we're doing assessment of uh, risk of bias, we'll talk about appropriateness and then the, the how to answer the question. Talk about them. And the question has to be appropriate. A good review question should be clear and must focus directly on the problems at hand. It should be answerable through literature search. So if you are dealing with a question that cannot be answered, please then don't do systematic review because systematic reviews answer questions, specific questions. Ask yourself, is this a question about background knowledge or foreground question? These two are very important. So now let us move on. What, we, what do we mean by uh, background knowledge questions? These are general questions about conditions. 
illnesses, syndromes, and patterns of disease and pathophysiology. They are usually composed of a question root. So what we mean by question root, and these are what, where, why, when, how, all these are question root, plus a verb, plus the condition or the a conditional state. So if you want to write a background question, you have a question root, what happens, what does, where, why, plus a verb, plus the condition as that you are interested or the problem. For example, what this example that I'm giving for a background knowledge question. What is the risk of a repeat reaction to amoxicillin or uh, cephalosporin in children with a history of a non-immediate reaction to amoxicillin? Sorry about amoxicillin. What what is the typical clinical presentation of cervical cancer? So, oh, look at it. The question root is what, what, but we can have some of them who, which are where, why, why is this, but not that, why, and then when. So we we'll get, as we go, we would uh, get example of so many of them later on as we do this, as we follow the systematic review journey. So, four ground questions. These are more often about issues of care. They query specialized and distinct knowledge needed for specific and relevant clinical decision making. So some of them, some questions are not that straightforward. They are foreground, that is the issues about care and knowledge needed to, or uh, for specific relevant clinical decision making. A well formulated, Foreground question uses the picos, the pico, and or the pico. That other time I mentioned the picos, but we're going to do a, a talk a lot about the picos or the pico, depending on which one we are using. So, best resources may include an evidence based claim where you can get evidence on this one, information about this type of questions, uh, what I've just uh, talked about. Pay attention to the questions component part, especially for foreground question. And examples of foreground questions, one, should neonates with possible late onset infection always have a lumbar puncture? Does continuous insulin infusion improve glycemic control and nutrition in hyperglycemic, very low uh, birth weight children or infants? Should Pre-medication be used for semi-urgent or elective in intubation in unit. These are some of them. Look at it. They are talking about the condition. These are not the why, the, the, the uh, question root, as we talked about here, the question root plus the verb plus the condition. But these are uh, the, uh, what we would talk about. This is uh, the knowledge about the care and about what you need to do to make a decision. So these are examples that have been given. Then how do we formulate the review question? What are the elements that we need to consider? The elements to consider, one, the population, the patient, or even what the other names which we can. Um, and then we also have to consider the intervention. We also have to consider the comparator, the, com uh, the control, the comparison. And then we have to consider outcome and then the study. But while some of the studies might not be interventional, and therefore we don't have intervention, and then you might not have the comparison or control if it's not a comparative study, almost every study will have a population and will have an outcome. So when you are defining your study, and if you're using the PICUS, and you come here and you don't have this over here intervention, and just don't write, you say no intervention over here, no comparator, but the outcomes you have to state and the study design unless it is explicitly stated, and if it is a Cochrane review. But if it's a Cochrane review, it all this one have to be present, because that, that time I said, Co Cochrane reviews uh, investigate interventions, normally comparative interventions, so it will look at intervention A versus intervention B. So normally you have the intervention, you have the control, and almost all of them are comparative studies. Nowadays, some, some other methods are evolving, but normally Cochrane reviews are randomized controlled trials with 
the one receiving intervention, another one receiving the control or a placebo. And that is what led to the peak coup. The Cochrane does not include S over here, steady design, which is the steady type, because what in, by default, all Cochrane studies are what randomized controlled trials, so we don't. And that is the first and foremost of even selecting a study for inclusion in a Cochrane review. So now we're going to take one by one. If you are defining your population, or if you are defining your question, why the, is the population so important? And then when we are assessing the risk of bias and then the validity, you will find that we have two forms of validity. So I'm not going to talk about them now. It's very interesting when you get there, you will know. But this one is the validity that talks, this is the all about the pickles or the question and the inclusion and exclusion criteria are about external validity. That is generalizability. It, they are not part of the internal validity, no but aspect about whether you can extrapolate your findings to the source population. And that is why you need this one. Are you dealing with the right people and then the intervention and then the outcome? And that is what we're going to look out for. So let's take the population. If the population should have a clear definition that would allow the identification of people of interest, that is the source population to whom the evidence is applicable. So when you are doing a study, you can include every study. So you have to now define the population that my population will be maybe children under five who have got malaria and have, we are going to talk about all of them. It should be succinctly defined and that is, what you the, the 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 clear definition of the population so that you can link your findings to the source population from which the participants were selected in the primary studies that we are considering in the systematic review aspects to consider you have to talk about the health condition how it is diagnosed and then why and by whom who diagnosed it example any limitations should have a clear rationale or should be explored in subgroup analysis. Others that you have to consider, normally all these things are characteristics of the uh, participants, age, sex, because you know that uh, clinical outcomes depend normally on, uh, depend so much on age, sex, socioeconomic status, education, uh, geographic location, even uh, rural, urban, etc. So if your these ones are relevant to the topic that you are doing and i can say the age and sex and socioeconomic status are always important for every uh, uh, review that you will do just consider this one as part of the population so define your population by which age group am i interested or am i interested in both sexes or maybe only females males alone which socioeconomic group am i talking about rich people or maybe every all this doesn't have to be specified if they are relevant to the interpretation of your systematic review. But if you an ability to be able to come out with all this and writing them down, I'll show you how you write them down, would help you to understand your topic or your question better. So it is very important. Take your time, go through this, don't just run through it. List all these things. So for example, let me say this. Uh, I'm interested in people with malaria. Uh, which group am I interested? Probably all, probably children under five. And then is it, are they the same? Malaria, the same. But the, on the basis of diagnosis, they are not the same. You have the PCR, we have the, the, the microscopy, we have the rapid diagnostic test. All of them different, they have different uh, sensitivities. So if we say that, uh, uh, malaria, it's not precise. You have to qualify it by the diagnostic tool. That is children under five diagnosed with malaria by PCR or by all diagnostic. It could be clinical diagnosis. They are not the same. So have to identify the diagnostic criterion and try to specify it as part of your um, population to define them. Then we talk about the intervention. 
this one why the intervention is very important because formulation is important the dose is important intensity unless it is not necessary in your or required in your systematic review otherwise take time which formulation am i giving especially if it is a, it will give in particular treatment mode of delivery timing frequency duration all these ones are important personnel especially those that require expertise the qualification experience and training are very important because a junior uh, person compared with a senior person normally the way they go about uh, doing things are different and normally uh, this uh, expertise or experiences will impact the final uh, evidence or outcome so describe all of them the location contest depending on the location and context hospital community setting all of them they impact uh, the evidence differently so you have to list all of them although we are not talking about uh, where they live we are talking about an intervention why the intervention is why are we talking about location and all those things we are saying that the location where the intervention is given or has been delivered is important because it can influence the outcome so the personnel who administered it especially if it's a complex procedure or what what, what uh, uh, maybe uh, a complex intervention where is the intervention or was the intervention given alone or in combination with other interventions you have to sometimes you just say yes we gave this intervention but we have multi mobility and for that matter more i uh, call this multiplicity of this medication and those things so tell about whether the people are receiving other treatments or not if they are receiving treatment you says okay all of them are receiving their normal treatment but this is the one that we are testing try to specify so that people will know whether the findings that you are getting is as a result of something else but not the intervention that you are giving so specify whether given a loan or in combination and you have to this is very important and you have to list all of them and define before you move on any limitations should have a clear rationale or to include and explore in subgroup analysis it's very important at a point subgroup analysis is important but your ability to explore differences by looking at this the clinical uh, characteristics on the basis of the pickles is very important and that is what makes difference between systematic reviewers two people may get uh, their systematic reviews published in the same paper but one may be well written one will give reliable evidence one may not all of them are based on the judgment and decisions that you make and these are some of the judgment and decisions that i told you about beforehand that the systematic review is a process which is made up of complex decisions and judgment these are some of the complex decisions and judgment some people may overlook this and other people will take their time to go through this which of them do you think would end up getting a reliable evidence the one who has taken his time to explore all the characteristics that would matter or would affect interpretation i think the one who takes time to do that would end up at, uh, at the end come out with reliable evidence and if the evidence is not reliable would, on the basis of what he or she has explored would be able to tell that this is this because of this and this and that so it is very important because probably the, the formulation given the route of administration that is what was leading to the differences of the intervention continue i've talked about contests already and these are some of the availability accessibility people would think that availability is not part of intervention if there is not available it can influence outcomes so equipment use experience all these things so please take note their slides will come to you so why are we considering all these things when talking about intervention because intervention should have considered only this formulation dos and that but we say intervention the effect of intervention goes beyond the formulation do say to include all these points that we have listed over here so when you are doing your systematic review please don't rush take your time to identify all these things define them 
and before you move on because your question is going to guide most aspects of the systematic review. Then let's talk about outcomes. I've jumped uh, comparators or con control. Why? Because whatever happens you do for the intervention, you do the same thing for the control, except the control, whatever. So if you mention the name of the control, that is it. If you want to consider the dosage formulation, you also consider the same thing for the control. The dosage intensity, you do the same thing for the control. So that is why I've left it out, because the same thing, it should be a repetition. So for the outcome, identifying meaningful outcome, you've talked about that, the one sought by professionals, policymakers. Normally, that is why when you're writing a systematic review, most of the, what I've taught my students is that you have to look for a topical uh, issue. If your uh, systematic review is not in demand, the question, people are not asking you questions about that, then probably you have to stop because you just publish it, but it will not be used you have to now look out for topical issues, questions that people are demanding, uh, the question demanding answers for. Those are the ones that you have to look. So please spend some time, look for very important or relevant topics before you write a systematic review. And So examples of outcomes that you want to measure sometimes effectiveness, but effectiveness itself is a composite. So you have to make it measurable, define it in terms of effectiveness, is it cure, failure, survivor, and then all other things. These are some of the common um, outcomes we come across. But the outcomes in systematic review, Normally, we have the primary outcome. As you will have an objective, you have the main and the specific objective. In the outcomes, we have the primary objective. The primary objective are the main outcomes that your systematic review is looking or answering. That is, you can have a maximum of three. Normally, it should be specific, maybe one. And then you can get some secondary uh, outcomes because after doing, when you're doing the systematic review, you will find that. There are so many outcomes that have been assessed that you don't have to discard them. But it probably, if you want to answer just the main or the primary uh, uh, the question, then you have to go by the primary outcome. You don't have to consider this, but it's not always wise to do that. So you, you give your, the num minimum number of your primary question a maximum of uh, three, and the secondary a maximum of seven. And that is for complex um, systematic review. If the systematic review is not complex, then maybe secondary outcome will be one, two, and that primary outcome one, that's okay. And then the study design. Which study design are we interested in? We know all the study design. I have a, something, a slide on the study design normally used in the epidemiology, but not this time. Probably if there's an opportunity, and then I'll see where it fits and you will revisit the study designs and why some of the important and the issues that you have to consider when you are uh, using any of them, cross-sectional study case control, cohort, randomized control, and now systematic review and meta-analysis and then qualitative studies. These are the study designs. So when we go back to the PICOs, we've sort of now defined all of them, P, I, C, O, S, study. And that is the study that we've just talked about. These are the common study designs that we come across. But now, a lot of studies are emerging from other areas that are not really in the domain of epidemiology that will use different study designs that you have to adapt. So normally systematic review, if you're a good systematic reviewer, we don't struggle to do any systematic review because it's a procedure, it's a methodical, you follow the methods. But there are some areas or aspects that you have to adapt. And that these are critical. So you have to make the decision as to whether you want to adapt or not. Otherwise, everything is the same. So let me give you an example of what as example of a question that you were looking for. I give you an example of the, the, the four uh, ground and then the background questions. And then, but now let's look at, as we have talked about the formulation of the question, let's look at the, the this one, people are a lot of people are waiting, so that's why it is interrupting, interrupt, interrupting me so much. I have to admit, so many of them, I think it comes here first. So, 
and I uh, uh, just coming. I don't know where they're coming from, but I'm just admitting them and keep on coming without stopping. So sorry about that when you see this kind of uh, distractions because probably uh, uh, totally if you are there and you can help me with that because it, a lot of them are waiting and they are keep on coming, so many of them. Yeah, don't worry, Tony. I'm admitting them, so you concentrate. Okay. They come, they pop up and they block the, what I'm doing over here. So don't worry, please I'm, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So what is the impact of prevention of mother to a child transmission of existing interventions to improve improve early infant diagnosis of HIV on the prevalence of HIV in children under five years in Africa? This is somebody's question. So do you see anything wrong with the question? Probably yes, probably no. Sorry about it. Probably yes, probably no. But after we sat down to use the PICOS, this one is no DTA PICOS because the DTA PICOS will be so detailed. You have to write everything. Just the simple PICOS. We said that this one, this population of interest is children under five, under five years. And then the intervention of interest is PMTCT, which is the preventive prevention of mother to child. And then other, we say uh, early, inf uh, and then existing interventions. These are the interventions of interest. We have a comparator over here, no. So there's no in, uh, comparator intervention. And then all those who did not receive the intervention, this will be our comparator. And over here, the outcome is what? HIV prevalence. You want to look at what the prevalence is or the outcome of HIV in this. And the study design has not been st stated over here because you won't, you won't find the study design over here. But if you pro prove, then if you have to answer the study, then you have to write something, then you prove it and say, that, oh, it has not been mentioned in the, as part of the title, but we are interested in randomized control trials. So this is a simple, but we have detail. You have to list all of them on the basis of what we have talked under population, intervention, comparator, HIV, uh, the outcome and then randomized control trial. So after doing this one, not just simple uh, way of formulating the question. It, this question, long question, changed from uh, what it is over here initially to uh, the formulated title, like impact of PMTCT on the prevalence of HIV in children under five in Africa. This is not part, we just add this one to a systematic review of randomized controlled trials. So this is where formulated, but that is, this was just a run through. But if you sit down to consider, sometimes I'll, I'll suggest this, when you are doing a systematic review, you it, it, it should go, it is back and forth. So you visit your type over and over again, something that you think you have done well over, you will come back and you find out, oh, something is there that initially you didn't see. And then you, when you take into consideration, you have to revise and um, reword or something, revise and move on. So this is not a straightforward, uh, maybe, uh, way of writing the, the, this uh, question. It is back and forth. You may go back and forth until you get the right question before you move on. And when you move on, then it's going to direct the rest of the systematic review. Another question. What is the effect of psychosocial stress on pregnancy and unital outcomes in low and middle income countries? This one, I've just seen the PICOS, uh, P, pregnant women and unit, uh, and unit. Over here, we talk about pregnancy, but over here, pregnant women and units, psychosocial. These are some of the simple way of doing your, or formulating or defining the elements in your uh, question. And there's another one over here that's does calcium supplementation and preeclampsia. No, something is there that I can I can see. Um, okay, I can't I hope you can see my over here. I'm not a tech expert, so. Something is blocking over here, but I see there's, there's calcium uh, supplementation. Okay, if you can see, let's go through it. What is the source, pop, the population of interest? Pregnant women. How do, were they, this diagnosed by elevated, uh, because you are talking about, is it eclampsia or preeclampsia? 
diagnosed by elevated BP. And then we define the BP as 140 uh, systolic and then 90 uh, diastolic millimeters of mercury with either proteinuria or evidence of end organ damage after 20 weeks of gestation. This is not, you can't see this one in the title, but if you want to now use the population to define things, you see how detailed the, the population has been defined by using the PICOs. Otherwise, looking at the title alone, you miss a lot of information about the, your population and the characteristics that make the population. And then look at the intervention. We're talking about over here, we only talk about calcium supplementation, but look at what we are interested in over here. Calcium supplementation, we are interested in pharmacologic, not dietary. So we would exclude dietary um, supplementation. And let me tell you this one before we go to inclusion and ex exclusion criteria. And this is the same thing. What we are talking about, or well, this is what you use for the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Under each topic, if you are talking about the population, that is where you look out for the things that you exclude and then talk about them. So if you're interested about pregnant women, don't say that then non-pregnant women will be excluded. No, I, this is a, it's a, it's a, it's so obvious, isn't it? That you included pregnant women, so pre, not, pre, uh, women not pregnant will be excluded. Or if you say, I'm going to include children, you say the obvious, oh, then adults will be excluded. No, you have to look at something else that will make scientifically uh, intuitive. Uh, so over here, the reason over here, dietary calcium supplementation will be excluded. It's not because we are giving calcium, so we are excluding something which is not calcium, but they are because of the formulation and the, 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 the one of interest you have to specify. So when you are writing under the intervention, that is where you have to state the in type of interventions that you're going to exclude. So over here, comparator or control, no calcium supplementation or placebo. So that is what we are interested in. Those who did not receive calcium supplementation or placebo. How about the outcome? We have two main outcomes and we talked about, which is the primary, secondary, but we have, over here, we don't, we haven't differentiated. But normally if you are doing a differentiate the primary outcome from the secondary outcome. So have two column, two lines, primary, and then secondary. For mothers, incidence of preeclampsia, onset of preeclampsia, severity, they are not all part of the title, but these are some of the things that you'll be interested in as uh, outcome. And because you are dealing with pregnant women, sometimes you may deal with the pregnant woman alone. If you are not interested in uh, the babies, you may report on the outcomes in the pregnant women alone. But normally, almost, most of the systematic review that have investigated pregnant women will also look at the effect. If there, there are some effect on the mother, then we also have to think that there will be effect on the children, unless you are not interested in, the, in them. So you have to look at the babies. Proportion of small for gestational age, low birth weight, perinatal death, stay birth, and all other things that we can think of on the basis of the effect of eclampsia or pre-eclampsia on the baby as has been identified by literature. So coming out with the best outcomes means that you have to read the literature. And normally what I say is that when you're reading the outcome, just read the, where you have the outcome, read about 10 of them. It takes about five minutes to read. By the time you have read the 10, all possible outcomes that you will come across would have uh, come across them and then you reach a plateau or you reach a saturation point and at that level you know that no other uh, important outcome is out there and that is when you have to be uh, confident with your the outcomes that you list and you said that okay on the basis of what I know there's no important outcome out there that I haven't included that you have to take note of that. And the study, we, this one is all studies, so case series, but all studies, but why? We're saying that we're interested in all studies, but case series and case studies will be excluded. So this is when you have to, because you're saying all studies are interested, but 
not case series and case studies. And that is one you have to specify that one under all studies. If you like, you have to list the study type that you are talking about, randomized control trial, to make sure that all studies mean you have the specific studies in mind. So take note of that. So now, do we introduce um, uh, Dr. Augustina Kodua as part of, as one co-principal investigator of the AMIPS uh, uh, project with uh, Tolib, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tolib. And then we said that this, you are going to use some of the AMIPS, uh, AMIPS protocol as example for this uh, systematic review journey as much as possible. When it's necessary, we would use it. Look at the systematic review protocol that we have developed is implementation of medicine, medicines, pricing policies in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a protocol for systematic review. So what are the elements that we consider? This is not the same as the normal Cochrane uh, systematic reviews that you come across. This is something moving away from implementation. So when you move to this and uh, study systematic reviews become complex. Who are my population? You can be thinking about the implementers and you can be thinking of the beneficiaries, those who benefit, a whole lot of things will come in. So you have to sit down and we, we discuss this at length to consider which would be, make, make our steady population. If you read over here, you see all those who are of the population of interest. And the, the intervention, the intervention over here is the implementation. You don't have actual intervention. That is intervention that we have assigned that, uh, given to people as exposure. But this is this one intervention will take what? The object of the study, normally the object of the study would fill the uh, uh, intervention space. And that is one implementation of medicine. So you know how implementation of medicine pricing policies have been done. And the list of all this and what we are interested in. We look at policy strategies as we outline. These are the ones that are of interest in this uh, systematic review over here look at we have any gender i'm going back to the participants talking about any gender age ethnicity socioeconomic status these are all interested we are interested in all these things and the urban rural uh, residents or oh, we have defined them there may be some of them that probably could have added but we think that these are the the the, the, the most relevant issues that people would consider and also, when we are interpreting our results, these are the ones that you will need to consider. So, when you come to the comparator, there's no comparison. So, we don't have a, it's not a comparative study. So, we don't have a comparison. Then, outcomes look at this. We have identified the outcomes over here. Look at, we over here, you see implementation of pricing policies. But over here, we are qualifying it with a successful implementation to be measured as reduction in, so how it's to be measured has also been included. Because somebody will say, how do you assess this one? It has to be smart, this over here, it is the same as the study objective, the specific objective. The outcome should be smart, it should be measurable, and if time bound and everything that would specify the specific objectives would also be specified over here. And then even the contest is in Sub-Saharan African contest over here, although you can also repeat this one also here in the, in the participants. So, and the study design, we, we've talked about that. So, this is the uh, first phase of it, and then I think we are done with the, uh, the protocol. So the protocol sort of help you for people to peer review the study for flaws and uh, the, the, the likelihood that uh, biases would be introduced in the systematic review process and all sorts of kind. And it is a very important document that will guide the review. So if you have it anytime, you visit the, the protocol. And after you have uh, fin finalized the protocol and in the course of doing the systematic review, things change. You have to come back and then visit the protocol and state the protocol that protocol we specify that this is what should be done or this is what we're going to do. But after going through the systematic review process, we identify that this and this and that. It's not some time ago, 
systematic reviewers, uh, editors were so strict that if you do something like that, they would say the systematic review has been compromised. But nowadays, if you would write everything well, describe what you did, it is trans uh, you've made it transparent and yes, it is acceptable. So sometimes you can uh, revise some sections of the systematic reviews uh, uh, on the basis of new evidence or what you have found, but report everything, don't hide anything. And but you don't overdo it. If you do it, overdo it, it means that you didn't take time to plan your protocol, your systematic review, and therefore that one will really compromise your study. Or this year, what I'm going to do next will be to show you how uh, review protocols are, are some of examples of review protocols, published review protocols, and maybe one or two, and then show you uh, the published systematic review, how that section about writing the review. Uh, inclusion and ex exclusion criteria are uh, uh, written. So let me tell you this, what we are doing over here, participants and this, these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The, the inclusion and exclusion criteria go hand in hand with the title. You can't separate the two because as you're defining the title or formulating the question, you're also uh, describing your participants, the intervention, the comparator and outcome as would have been uh, defined by the PICOs uh, that you're going to use. So this is what I have for the uh, protocol and then uh, formulating the question. And we would, I'll show you examples. So Tolib, over here, do you think we need to give maybe five minutes break or something for them and then we all should continue? Um, okay, yeah, that's fine. Well, thank you very much, Tony. First things first, big round, mm -hmm. put your uh, virtual and uh, physical hands together for um, Tony. Brilliant presentation, fantastic. So as suggested, let's take maybe five minutes off, maybe comfort break, some kind of reflection, conceptualization break. Uh, and those of you who are not uh, planning to kind of move away from screens to get their cups of tea or water, can I encourage you to maybe drop your comments, your questions, your reflections into the chat room. And I will be uh, keeping an eye on the chat room. Um, and in about five, six minutes, we will reconvene uh, being ready with comments, questions, and reflections. Does that sound okay with you, Tony? Uh, just yes, that, that's see. okay with me. Okay, well, I hope it is okay. Yeah. In the meantime, I have also texted the link to the Prospero oh. protocol registered uh, uh, from the AMIPS study. So um, do have a look at it um, at your spare time. Um, and then we'll reconvene in about five minutes. Okay. So thank you. And thank you. Um, see you in about five. Thank you.
Okay. So we are about five minutes in our break, and we said that we'll reconvene in about five. So um, hopefully people had enough time to top up their tea cups and, and, and sort of um, um, arrive back. Um, there is a person called Florence Shibido who is trying to connect, and, and she has been kind of trying to connect for the last half an hour, on and off. I don't know if colleagues know her, and if so, please, would you mind just dropping her an email saying that I think there may be something wrong with the connection because uh, we keep admitting her to the um, seminar, but um, she doesn't seem to be able to connect through to the session. Um, um, and that, that's what Tony was um, reflecting earlier. Okay, well, um, can I welcome everybody back at this point? Uh, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat function. Um, I don't see any questions, comments, or reflections. Um, and just to recap, Tony has uh, um, kind of provided a really in-depth and um, practical overview of the protocol for the systematic reviews, what it entails and uh, specifically highlighted um, the considerations in developing good questions for the review as well as um, kind of search criteria and, and inclusion kind of parameters um, and uh, zoomed into the specific um, elements of the um, search parameters such as the PICO um, elements. Okay, so with that in mind, um, can I open this up for any comments, questions, reflections? Uh, you can either raise your hand virtually and um, unmute yourselves and speak, or indeed um, drop the um, issues, uh, questions, comments, reflections through the chat function. Yeah. Before then, Lord, can I excuse you? I wanted to just show example, just a snapshot of what so that people can now feel what it is, uh, what a protocol is, and just going through some, not uh, what has been published so that it, at least those who are not familiar. Okay. Have, yes, okay. So. Well, do you want to take maybe some time doing that? And I think earlier you also mentioned that you wanted to um, showcase the Refman. Um, as well. So if you yeah. want to take time to do that, and that will okay. give colleagues a bit of time to get their thoughts together and okay. formulate okay. their questions. Okay. Um, and thank you to Florence. I, I just saw your text saying you had a bad network challenge. Yes, the papers will be available afterwards, just uh, uh, and, and apologies for not being able to kind of um, um, connect you properly. Uh, back to you, Tony. Um, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Let me share um, my screen. This is first the Cochrane. This Revman is a software which is widely used by systematic reviewers because Cochrane spend a lot of time and Cochrane is pioneer in systematic reviewing. They have a lot of methods group. I, I recommend if you want to do systematic review for the start, please read the Cochrane uh, uh, systematic review handbook, which I'll make it available to you in my next session. But if you have the Revman, which we're going to, everybody, if you're interested, you can download the Revman. It is also part of this, uh, uh, the, uh, they will find a handbook also over here. So let me show you this one. When you open the Revman, this is how it looks like. You have an abstract over here. We know that, look at it, it's faded. So when you open here, when you click over here, it gives you all this, and this is a protocol. Having 
entered any data. So it's a protocol. If I'm doing this is faded, it means that you can't add anything over here. And that is what I, I outlined previously in one of my slides that a systematic review protocol does not include or does not have an abstract. It does not have a plain language. But when you come here, you see that something is here. The background, this is the background of the systematic review. And if it is in line with the Cochrane uh, review, these are the, the subsections that you need to consider when you're writing the background. Description of the condition, uh, description of the intervention, how the intervention might work, uh, why it is important to do this review. These questions are not easy to answer. So once you have been able to answer this one in your background, it means that your background is focused. We know that the condition and then the intervention at stake, how the intervention might work, and why your study is important, your review is important. That is the justification. So when you come here, you always have objectives. So you state the objectives. Over here, you have the freedom to specify whether you want to make it primary and secondary or main objective and specific objectives you can write. But look at over here, all this you can write, or it's, some, it's a software which is comp it's like Word. You can write everything over here in this space, in the Revman space. So you can do that and later on you can copy and paste in Word. And maybe if you want to submit, you, you just follow this uh, principles of the editorial uh, formatting and uh, submit. But you can write, you can edit, you have all the functions over there. Later on, probably we'll talk about that, but not for today. Today, I only want to show you the, the outline, the how you the skeleton of the pro, uh, pro, uh, protocol, the kind of things that you will need to consider when you write the protocol. So when you come to the methods, look at it. On the slide I give, I just made it methods. But when you expand, the method has a lot of things. The method section has a lot of things to consider. Criteria for considering studies for this review. You have to talk type of studies. This is what comes first, because this is Cochrane. Cochrane co uh, studies is the most important because Cochrane reviews assemble randomized control trials. So over here, all that you state is a randomized control trial. If not, it doesn't even can, it, it, it cannot be a corporate review. So take note of that. And then the type of participants or the population of interest or the patients, this is what we are talking about. And that is why I'm saying I'm going to show you how you write this one. So these are the skeleton, the subheadings. But I'm going to give you examples of how this have been written so that when you are writing, you have a feel of. Because look at theory is different from doing it. Sometimes you give a nice lecture and you think that people will go back and be able to do it, but they are unable, something small. But if I show you how to write it, you will see how fast it will be for you to go about writing a systematic review. So the type of participants, and then you come to the outcomes, primary and secondary over here is divided for you. You can write over here, my primary outcomes are, or my, this or can write anything over there and the secondary outcome and the search, uh, methods for identification of studies. This is the next webinar we're going to, uh, in this series, the next webinar we're going to have, how we develop the search strategy and then how we search for studies and how we manage the output of search. And that communication will be sent. So we will, every information will be given you. It is very interesting that the search is most of the things that lot of people, new things that people are going to learn. For most of the researchers, especially coming from the uh, low and middle income countries, a lot of people are not familiar with this, uh, this uh, the issues around that. And this is normally when I give systematic reviews, one of the important areas that people like most, and I hope you are going to enjoy the search methods and how to manage your search output. So don't miss the next webinar. It's going to be very interesting. And then you have to be divided it into electronic searches, searching other sources, data, and then you come to data collection and analysis, selection of studies, data extraction. So it is following the methodical process of systematic reviewing, the one I, I outlined over there. So when you assess the risk of bias in the included studies, and then we also have a lot more over here. Uh, heterogeneity, dealing with uh, unit of analysis, 
measures of treatment, dealing with missing data, assessment of heterogeneity, assessment of reporting bias, data, and then you come to data synthesis. And then once you get to data synthesis, you include also if there's the need to do subgroup analysis or an investigate statistical investigation of heterogeneity, you have the possibility to do that and sensitivity analysis. This is over here, that last bit of it is in the domain of the meta-analysis. That is the quantitative part of systematic review. As I, the other time, talked about, we have the qualitative and we have the quantitative. This is the quantitative part. Over here, most of the things are statistical. So that is all about the protocol. There's no results, there's no discussion, there's no author's conclusion, but when you write protocol, you have to acknowledge because people might have contributed, those who have peer reviewed and their contribution of authors, it's the same as writing a peer review paper and the declaration of interest and those things. So let me move away from this Cochrane software. There are so many functions over here that as we go later on, we will come back to that and then we will, how we're going to use the Cochrane uh, uh, software, Revman, to help us uh, guide the systematic review that we're going to do. So I'm saying that if you want to write a good systematic review, just follow these steps and the, the, the subheadings that do not apply to your study, just ignore it or just highlight it so that it, as it goes away and then just write under the use only the subheadings that matter in your systematic review. So that is just about the Cochrane, um, systematic, Cochrane software. So let us move on to one study that published in BMJ. Sorry, am I still sharing my, my screen or have I gone out? No, you are not sharing the screen at the moment. But I'm sharing. No, you are not sharing at the moment, okay. but you can okay. um, share again. Okay. Okay. So, am I sharing now? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. So look at an example of a protocol. This is not a... a, a fully completed systematic review. That is why we are saying that if you do your systematic review and you do it well, you do some editorial based or journals that will publish the systematic review protocol. It requires some, a lot of uh, time, but it helps you. You get two publications for, uh, for the same uh, study, the uh, systematic review that you do, and as opposed to those who just wrote the, the systematic review and published it, they will have one, but you can have two. And this has been published in BMJ Open, which is highly, it's a, it's a, it has a high impact factor. So look at hypertension prevalence, incidence, and risk factor factors among children and adolescents in Africa, a systematic review and meta-analysis protocol. We are not going to consider anything, but this is, uh, this one, BMJ accept abstract. So look at it. But even any of the protocols, you can write your abstract, accept the results, because the results is what you don't have. So over here, do you have results? No. Over here has reported the methods and analysis. That is the plan, how your methods uh, section is going to look like and the analysis for what software, the processes, the process that you're going to consider the assumptions, everybody will be reported over here as it, uh, uh, in the part of the uh, protocol. And over here, ethics and dissemination, but we, don't, we see over here, we don't have, uh, we, we don't have Results. Look at something that I'm talking about. This is the trial registration number. So you see the CLD, the Prospero is what we are talking about. Prospero is housed at, at the Center for Reviews and Dissemination, which is CLD. And then when you register, it gives you a number. So this person registered it over there before proceeding to uh, uh, publishing or uh, uh, sending it for publication in BMD. The background, don't, I'm not going to talk about the background, but look at the kind of what other people do. Over here, look, some ed editors have said that they have lumped everything together to form one exclusion criteria. And then over here, they have put everything one together to form the inclusion criteria. It is, it is okay to do that. 
I'm just want to show you the differences so that don't say that always oh, you have to just talk about the population separate, talk about this. If that you do that, it helps you a lot because it helps you to uncover most of the things that will help you in, the, in your interpretation and if questions arise. But this one, look at the criteria for considering studies for the review. This inclusion criteria, so it lists everything and then it lists everything under exclusion criteria and that is okay. Immediately we move to the search for studies. So this is all that I want to show you about criteria for considering the study. So look at the review question. This review, uh, this review of studies published in this, you can ask something, but it doesn't matter. Let's move on to another um, study that I want to share. Now we move on to another protocol. This one also has been published. The first one by BMJ Open. This one by the Campbell Collaboration. They also have a database that publishes uh, protocol. The women and adjuvant interventions for improving the developmental health and well-being of children in low and middle income countries. A systematic review and network meta-analysis. Look at another thing that we are going to see over here, network meta-analysis. When we do network meta-analysis, when we get to the uh, synthesis of data, when we get to the quantitative aspect of it, the meta-analysis, uh, we will also talk about network meta-analysis and how to go about it. But look at it. The title is really long, but it's important. It has been formulated using the PICO. So all the PICO's element, the important PICO's element are there. So, but some journals will restrict. They will force you to now stay, trim this one down to cut the number of words and then make it something concise. But this one, they allow that. Look at this is a protocol published. So you can use it for any publications that you have. The background is there. And then look at this one to look at how it has been talked about. The burden of disease, it follows the Cochrane. Uh, pharmacologic interventions follow the Cochrane uh, way of preparing this a systematic review, how the intervention might work as we saw from the Cochrane side. Now let us go to look at some complex and proposed logic models. So you are not limited to, if you think that a conceptual framework can help your systematic review, please do it. People think that a smart review does not. Now I'm beginning to think that now we have to even reinforce, emphasize the way uh, uh, conceptual frameworks, because that is what you sort of going to show how the factors you are talking about, the interplay between the actors is very important. And whether you are getting something wrong, this, this is a snapshot. It will tell us straight away that the concept is wrong or how the, you, you propose to uh, the propose, uh, put the, how you propose to do things is wrong. So this is another uh, systematic review protocol I'm showing you because we have different forms. So you have always consider the editorial base and keep to their in-house format. So objective of the review, see this one, uh, we are writing a lot. It's a proposal, but writing a lot. And the methods look at the same thing has come. This is what I want to talk about. The criteria for including studies in the a review. Look at the participants over here. Look at how it is not just one sentence. Children, uh, children from six months to 16 years. When you look at the title, do we have this specified over there? No. But you over here, we have an opportunity to specify the age range uh, in whom in, in where endemic areas in low and middle income countries. That is it. As defined, look at it, defined by. So all the important things that you think will help define your population, you have to include. Regard, don't write a lot, uh, don't, don't include irrelevant, irrelevant things, include relevant, but sometimes you can have one paragraph, which is a bit, uh, quite a number of words, but which if they are used, it's the, uh, all the things you are mentioning are useful, it's still okay. And then intervention, look at how many, the, how long the intervention is. Everything has been specified, look at it from here. I'm just showing you know, how detailed your, uh, description of the intervention can and the paper is here probably when i finish i can send it to you so it's sometimes straightforward some of them not straightforward and this review is not straightforward because Campbell 
reviews are not straightforward. Comparisons, look at it also a lot of them. And then outcome, you have the primary outcome and you have the secondary outcome. So defining things, we will accept studies that use one of the following three types of comparisons and be going to discuss. I'll send it to you and the later one if you are interested. So study types, that will be the last. Look at study type we are talking about. We will include randomized control trials and controlled clinical trials, which may be randomized at the individual or cluster level. We will also include quasi experiment. So all the things that you think matter, you have to include, unless otherwise the journal put some restrictions on the number of ways you can write for both Cochrane and then uh, Campbell and those who have their own editorial basis, you have unlimited degrees to express yourself in a way which will help uh, interpret the uh, reliability of your findings. So then we move to search, and that is what will be considered next time. So that's why we move it over here. But look at this inclusion criteria, how long it can be. Let's move on to another one, which is let's look at a Cochrane as the last one, Cochrane systematic review. And having done all this, and that, I also want to show you one of mine. So why not? So this is my name, uh, Danswa Pia, and did it with the Cochrane drugs for treating Shizosoma Mansona infection. Mm -hmm. This sort of this is a global uh, question. So look at it with the idea that we are going to include every uh, study, every intervention out there. And if I didn't say that at that time, this, this study won the, the 20th anniversary Cochrane collaboration, uh, Cochrane uh, uh, 20th uh, anniversary. So it is, it is well written. So if you have to follow some of the methods, it's not because it was written by me, but I think it's well written. So you look at it and then now let's look at the, and look at the Cochrane abstract. It can be overly long. Look at it, the background from here, it sort of summarizes all the important things that people, policy makers who do not have time to go through the, the, the whole paper to also have information about. So this is a plain language. I think my time is overly, I've spent a lot of time, but I think this is necessary. That is why I want to do this one next week. We're moving to um, the, uh, uh, over here, I chose to write a lot of things against the standard uh, standards of the of the Cochrane. So diagnosis I brought because it's important, symptoms of effect I brought. You can choose to bring something which is important. Why it is important to do re this review, then I came, description of the intervention is there, but I also added other things that I thought were important and you can do the same. So now let's come to the criteria for considering the studies. Look at type of studies, because it's a Cochrane, uh, review we just say randomized control trials and that's all we not we were not interested in quasi randomized so quasi randomized studies will be excluded type of participants and this one have been described by the participants and how they are diagnosed type of intervention you have listed the type of interventions everything here type of outcomes primary secondary and then adverse outcomes and this is how we're going to we're going to write the inclusion and exclusion criteria so you use the PICOS and the PICOS will guide you to write the P, the I, the C, O, S. That is what you write. So these are some of the examples that I'm showing you. This is a published, this is not a protocol, full systematic review, but the earlier ones I showed you, the two BMJ and then the Campbell collaboration, all those are a protocol, published protocol. Thank you. I think now I leave, I come, I give uh, totally, I'm done, so please take over. Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Tony. If you want to unshare your screen so we can see each other and perhaps kind okay. of see. Um, and first things first, let me find my virtual clapping hands. There you go. Um, so um, thank you once again. Uh, it's particularly helpful to see the practical examples and I can see lots of clubs, virtual clubs going. So I want to congratulate you on the successful um, you know, presentation as well. Um, so that's, that's brilliant. Uh, and it is particularly helpful to have these diverse examples of Cochrane, Campbell collaborations and, and, and sort of more standard systematic reviews 
uh, published protocols as well as the final products. Um, so that's good. I have been encouraging colleagues to kind of share any questions, comments, reflections. I don't see any um, comments coming through the chat function. So let me just pause at this point and open this up for any reflections, feedback, discussion points, any issues for clarification. Just uh, raise your hand or, uh, and, and, or, or kind of um, text your issues through the chat function. And I'm trying to keep an eye on all these different um, sections of this platform. So um, one at a time, please. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just give colleagues a bit of time. Uh, um, Tony, are you still connected? Um, uh, I think you may have disappeared for a second. I don't know if that's the connection issue. Well, hopefully you are connected. But let me kind of, um, so the floor is open for any comments, questions, reflections. Um, and it's good to see that kind of continuity of this webinar series. So the first was on very much introductory overview of what the evidence synthesis and good systematic reviews are about. So this is about the protocol, the search criteria. And then the next, I think Tony has already kind of highlighted that would be zooming into the search strategies. Um, okay, any, any comments, questions? Reflections. Don't hesitate to chip in and remember there are no silly questions here. So it's a relatively you know, safe space to, to raise issues and the whole idea is for us to kind of reflect and engage and then more interaction obviously will have better effect on overall outcome. Of, uh, that, that we will all get from this session. All right. Uh, can't see any questions. I think Tony dropped momentarily, but he's rejoining now. So welcome back, Tony. Thank you. And um, so many apologies. You can tell by our side of the world here. All of a sudden, not knowing that the IT people are sitting somewhere doing things and they all shut it down. So no, I have had to use a backup now. Sorry about that. Don't worry, the connection issues, they're all applied to pretty much everybody these days. Um, and most of the world is online these days anyway. So that, that yeah. puts a very different spin okay. in it. Well, we haven't missed um, any questions yet. Uh, I'm, um, okay, so there is uh, Natalie just texted. Uh, thank you for the informative session. Great to see the mechanics of the protocol production. So brilliant. So it's more of a comment rather than question. So fantastic. Um, feel free to text or raise hands. I'm scrolling up and down the participants list. So not to miss any raised hands. Um, and um, obviously unmute yourself and engage as you see appropriate. Um, and it's particularly helpful to see uh, the ongoing kind of examples such as the AMIPS project that we're, uh, well, many of us are involved in various roles uh, where we haven't gone all the way through to the, the whole process, but we are kind of, um, 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 in halfway through the, well, now it's what the full text screening completed and then kind of launching into the data extraction. So there are thanks from Liviana as well. So nice in-depth presentation. So thanks are coming your way, Tony. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, and from Chi, um, from Hanoi University of Public Health. So also thanking for the presentation. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, no questions. I think um, usually when I kind of uh, present something, no questions mean two things. Either everything is perfectly clear and all the issues have been adequately addressed, um, or everything is so unclear that you're not sure where to start. And I'm sure we are in the former category of um, everything is very clear and, and uh, well covered. Okay, so there is a point from Moji. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and the question is, can PICOs be used for the background and foreground uh, review question? Uh, I think it, well, sorry, let, let me not answer this then and, and, um, to you, um, um, Tony. Um, yes, uh, Emoji, you know that the slide I showed that one of them is suited to the PICOs and one of them is not. So I'm sending you the background, and this is a small assignment I want to give you now to when do you get the slides? Quickly check that one, and then let's see. So I should have answered, but you see, this was an interactive uh, work that we are doing. And then I stated it clearly on the, on the slide where I mentioned the picos, the pico, and the pico, that one of them, the foreground or background, one of them is suited to that. Look at it, and if you don't have uh, uh, answer get back to me and why i'm saying that is that uh, I'm, I'm i'm closely linked with moji because he's the one from the african academy of sciences that we're working closely together so moji this is a sort of an, a small assignment for you but those who also want answers please this is what makes us interactive so that you just also check the notes that i have given you and if you have further questions please send it to uh, Dr. Tolley, and then he will share it with us. Yeah, fantastic, brilliant. Um, and um, it doesn't always have to go through me, so very happy for, well, as long as you feel comfortable, um, Tony, to, for, for your kind of um, email maybe to be shared, and then for all the questions to come to you. And, and uh, But in the meantime, there are, um, thanks from Anna um, and um, Temi um, from um, Leeds and, and University of Lagos, respectively. So that's good. Okay. Any any other questions, reflections? Um, I don't want to drag it longer than it's needed, but at the same time, I don't want to shortchange the colleagues and, and kind of brush through this. Um, okay, so thanks from Irene Ajipong as well. So that's good, um, clear presentation. So she's reinforcing the thanks and the uh, message. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, well, hopefully that was a useful kind of session, certainly a reminder to those who have gone through uh, similar exercises before of the uh, kind of importance of the protocol and the importance of kind of having that almost methods manual, methods handbook for the whole thing quite clear in the beginning before you get going with the, uh, with the rest of the systematic reviews. Um, and um, the specific examples um, are always useful to put this in perspective and kind of equip um, colleagues with um, something concrete and tangible to um, kind of use almost as a resource base. So as a minimum, we will obviously share the recording. We will, um, I think we are to share the presentation as well. And I'm just looking at you, Tony, in particular. Um, just to correct me if I'm going in the wrong direction. No. With all the, you will uh, share. You will um, share. And uh, the links and examples to all the um, various papers and the repositories that you were highlighting throughout. I think some of them are in the presentation, but some of them are as 
um, standalone documents. Uh, and with any further questions, please do engage um, um, directly with Tony or through me or through the individual projects. I think um, through Augustina um, as well, through AMIPS and, and then perhaps me and, and others uh, within the response project too. Okay, well, I don't see any further questions. Um, and thanks again for from Florence. Uh, um, great to see you um, connected at last, Florence. Uh, you're on and off for, for about 40 minutes continuously. So um, sorry about the connection speed. Well, I don't see any um, further questions, reflections, which probably means that people need to think about it, reflect sleep on it and i'm sure as uh people engage with uh, the kind of steps and thinking and reflection and um kind of uh, and perhaps doing some of these systematic reviews then that um, and further kind of engagement would be really useful um so that's um and then in the meantime there is um, also thanks from christopher um, um uh, uh, you know who is emphasizing that um, it's it's uh, hopefully will enhance the urban and regional planning research so that's that's fantastic okay so i think that's pretty much as far as we could have gone at this point can i maybe check with you tony um, if there are any final kind of comments remarks any reminders maybe hints, tips, pointers that you would like to highlight before we kind of outline the next steps and, and, and close the session. Yeah, what I can say is that normally in doing systematic reviewing from my little experience I have, I see that normally people overlook this section of the systematic review process. They just write a topic and then inclusion and exclusion criteria there's is uh don't have any uh like spend time on it so even when i we advertised that and said that how to prepare the review protocol formulating the research people thought that ah, why do we need to do this because probably this one will take about 30 20 minutes to do so people might not have put value on it that is why probably yes but if we are uh, now begin to sensitize ourselves uh, this is the part that is going to guide the systematic review, all that we do. Then later on, people would so uh, uh, appreciate that. So I'm happy with those people who attended, but I'm thinking that those, some people did not attend because they thought that this is straightforward, something that maybe uh, 10 minutes would be done because many people don't. They put it as part of the systematic review without even highlighting the need for it. So, I that is the word I'm with those who have taken it. Please, when we are doing a systematic review, I urge you plan, take time to spend a lot of time on this, especially the picos element. The picos, 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 picos. It will come back and back and back. And if you understand the picos, you, your study would always be generalizable and it will help you to interpret all the things that you're doing. So, yeah, that's all that I say. Thank you all for coming. I've enjoyed, although I didn't see you when I was talking, but I hope that we've all enjoyed this uh, part of it. But I'm um, also tell your uh, colleagues that the next section is, uh, uh, the next is this session is very important. Developing the search strategy and then uh, searching for studies and managing is very important that I myself looking forward to it. That, I'll learn a lot. So please let us all join. And if you really want to understand systematic review or you want to do a good systematic review, not the shoddy way, that's what people like. So take all the things seriously. Thank you so much. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Very useful reminders. Um, and I'm sure at the end of the webinar series, we will be very um, kind of proficient. Uh, with uh, different acronyms, um, including PICOS, and, and then yeah. there is a few others uh, on the way as well. Uh, brilliant. Well, uh, the webinar series will carry on. 
um, there seemed to be enough interest from colleagues and certainly you know, a, a great opportunity for us to learn from um, vast experience and expertise uh, from Tony and, and, and you know, from his colleagues at the University of Ghana. So we have agreed uh, that um, from, from AMIPS and response projects, w which are hosting these kind of webinar series, that we will, instead of having the ad hoc arrangement, we will have a standing arrangement. And I think we provisionally agreed the second Wednesday of the month at the same time. So the next one works out as, uh, let me just see, 9th of September. Um, in the in the morning or afternoon, depending on uh, on the time zone uh, you're in, so we will walk towards this day. In the unlikely event, if there will be any urgent commitments uh, that will prevent Tony from um, running the session, we will of course update everybody. But in the meantime, please do mark your calendars and and encourage others to participate, and we will certainly be in touch with the zoom link as well as the updated flyer invitation for the session um, and all is left to do is just to thank um, tony once more time thank you uh, for the wonderful opportunity to learn from your experience and to share and um, as i was mentioning earlier this is a great opportunity one of the unique opportunities for the um, kind of um, capacity um, strengthening um, being led by the global south, so to speak. Um, yeah. So uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. It's, yeah. it's, I'm really, really pleased uh, that uh, we're using this opportunity. Brilliant. Uh, let me find my uh, virtual clapping hands. Uh, there you go. So um, uh, thanks one more time, Tony. And thanks everybody for connecting and being patient um, and engaging. Uh, fantastic and uh, um, great to see everybody on board. Good luck with your next steps in the systematic reviews and uh, bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tony. Bye. bye. Thanks, Natalie. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye from Vietnam. Bye. <laughs>